So this is a film about the recent conversation between Jordan Peterson and John Vivaki. And for it, I'm joined by Paul van der Klee. How are you doing, Paul? I'm doing well. It's great to be here. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm really glad to have you here to kind of make sense of what happened. Because it's a conversation that we and a lot of other people were really, really looking forward to. Um, real anticipation, uh, seeing Jordan and John together. And I think there was a real split in reaction to it between people going, what was that? If you look at the comment section below it, I've, I've never seen so many people respond negatively to Jordan's interruptions of John. Um, I'd say that's the main sort of theme of the comments, which is extraordinary in itself. Um, and But also that there's a lot of... Um, I kind of liken it like panning for gold because there are a lot of golden nuggets within the conversation, but it's quite difficult to access them. It didn't flow very well. Um, and I think it's a really interesting... I think shining a light on what actually happened and maybe what the backstory was could give a lot of help to people to, to make sense of it. What are the difference in perspectives between John and Jordan? What was really going on? Um, and I'm, I'm going to sort of just do a quick little bit of framing first, Paul, before we get into kind of your reaction to it and what we made of it when we first saw it. But if people are not familiar with John's work, maybe they're, they're very familiar with Jordan, but not so familiar with John. So John Viveki is worked alongside uh, Jordan in the uh, psychology department at the University of Toronto. They both have deep interests in kind of the, the area of myth, religion, the deep story of Western culture. John had this series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, 50, 50 episodes that he brought out, probably in the wake of Jordan's kind of um, appearance on the stage as a kind of, he probably prompted a little bit by that. And John has had a huge amount of really interesting conversations over the last couple of years with people, yourself, Jonathan Pajot, um, many of the people in the same kind of orbit around these sort of central questions of meaning, questions of meaning, questions of um, the, the, the deep story, that dr the deep stories that drive us, all of the same topics that Jordan is really interesting in, interested in. Um, I was fascinated by the clickbait title that Jordan chose for the video, a conversation so intense it might be psychedelic, um, which is interesting as well. This feels like a really this feels like a really significant coming together of of um, perspectives that we've been waiting and wanting to see. I'd, I'd like to start by saying they had a real enthusiasm for each other and a real. I'm going to play a little clip now that came up at the end, like the real enthusiasm and warmth between the two of them. I've been a, a great proponent of yours, you know. Uh, I mean you. that. I mean that in the sense of noting the greatness that's in you and and seeing how it's manifested itself, especially in your relationship with your students, and noticing that and well, and I, having admiration and respect for that. And I respect your work, and you know, I, I disagree with it in parts, but it's always we've always been able to do that in a way that is born with affection and, and respect. Well, um, God, it's always nice to find someone who disagrees with your work, who could help correct it. Exactly. Seeing the I mean, other thank God, as, man, yeah. that's why I want to talk to you. I don't mm -hmm. like being wrong. So, and I know you don't. And so no, no, exactly. no doubt we're still both pretty wrong. Well, mostly so. Um, yes. If the history of science is something we should pay attention to, which we should. Yes, yeah, or the history of our own life for yeah. that matter. Yeah. And I know, Paul, you've put out a couple of reaction videos to this and you've sort of been wrestling a little bit with what happened. Maybe you could start by framing what you were hoping for from the conversation and what your reaction has been to it so far. I, too, was very much looking forward to this conversation. I know, I know John's work fairly well, at least in these areas, and I know he's got some critiques of Jordan's approach to meaning through narrative, uh, through hero mythology. And I was really anticipating those two working through some of those kinds of issues, and they never got there. I, My reaction, like many other people's, was, what was that? I had never heard Jordan like that before. I was amazed at how 
well John Verveke sort of rolled with all of the redirections that happened in the conversation? You fundamentally understand God by saying what God is not, but not, of course, randomly, right? Um, what you're mm. trying to do is... Oh, you, that's sort of like the God of the gaps. Well, no, 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 no. no, no. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's, don't apologize. We're, we're friends talking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I don't, I, I don't want to derail the, the conversation, ah, so... Uh, the, there's been, it's been like this, and it's been wonderful. It feels to me like doing Tai Chi. Behind that conversation, especially on Jordan's side... I think part of it is he, you know, he and John Verveke last spoke in 2015. John Verveke has continued his academic trajectory and I think with his YouTube channel and all of these conversations with him sort of discovered a whole new pathway where Jordan has been busy with his health, the culture war stuff. So I saw, I'm, I'm seeing this much more as a video where, Jordan is to a degree getting introduced for the first time with what John has been doing for the last five years. Mm. Yeah. And that was my sense as well, was that John was, John is so enthusiastic anyway. Like he's, he brought that enthusiasm to the conversation and Jordan, I think got him, got kind of swept up in that to some degree as well. And it was kind of John reporting back to Jordan, like, look what you've been missing or look what's been going on. Look at all this interesting stuff that's been happening. But I want to start by pointing to like the central paradox of the conversation is that John's central interest is in dialogos, which is kind of a shared dialogue that goes somewhere new. And he kind of summarized it in there with talking about Philea Sophia versus Philea Nicaea. Philea Nicaea meaning the love of victory, philia sophia, meaning the love of knowledge. We haven't talked about why people want us to talk. And the reason they want us to talk is because our ideas dovetail to a substantial degree and also diverge interestingly. And so I guess well, they that, want us to talk so that we can think. <laughs> well, that's it. And they, see, that's what so I was going to say. That's one of the defining, I would say one of the defining, uh, uh, it certainly seems to be the case as a defining criteria for Socrates, that if you and I can get to places uh, in the dialogos that we couldn't get to individually, then real dialogos has uh, has come into existence. And that's philia sophia, the love of wisdom, as opposed to philia nikea, the love of victory. And so... Right, think, right, right, right. I didn't I, know those phrases. Phaia, yeah. say it again? Philia sophia, which is the... Philia, you know, philia so sophia, philia, sure. You know, wisdom is the feminine yeah. essence of God. Yeah, well, and also but the philia is, you know, it's itself a collaborative love. Uh, oh, did you say philia? Yeah, philia. Phi, yeah, philia. Phi, philia and phi. Philia, philia, Sophia. So philia, the, Sophia. The three loves: yeah. eros, philia, agape. This is philia, and philia is the love that is done. It, it is expressed and shared in community. And then Sophia, of course, is the uh, word for wisdom. That's where we get philosophy from. I um, mean, philia, Jeez. philia, Nike yes. is the love of victory, like Nike victory. And right. What, and yeah, it's interesting because the it's tell me what you think of this. I think the YouTube dialogues that we undertake are characterized by Philea, Philea Sophia and the YouTube dialogues conducted in the main by the uh, what would you call it? Legacy media are Phila, Philea, Nikia. Nikia. I, I, Nikia. I, I totally Philea, agree with Nikia. you. And I think people appreciate Philea Sophia much better. Oh, you, you better believe I it. Certainly I certainly appreciate it much better. For John, this is, and he studied it a lot as a cognitive scientist, it's how can you have a conversation that goes somewhere new, that builds upon itself, that is not about trying to best the other person or just kind of repeat what you already know, but how can you have a, a dialogue where you discover new territory together? And I think the interesting thing for me is given that that was the subject of their talk, the question is how much they achieved that in that conversation. And I mean, if you go by the, the YouTube comments, you'd, you'd probably say that they didn't achieve it very much. And it, it goes to the heart, I think, of what I consider like the trajectory of Jordan Peterson over the last, since his kind of eruption onto the stage, the whole Peterson phenomenon of kind of 2018 onwards, um, that sense of, novelty and whether my, like my overall sense of, of him getting slightly stuck in his story, which I'll come to a little bit in, the, in, a, in a bit, but there was this weird almost performative contradiction given the topic that 
that John has made this kind of lifetime study of, of, of what does it mean to get into a flow state together? What does it mean to explore new territory together? What does it mean to, to actually know the cognitive science, science of what is going on physiologically when we're in this kind of flow state of exploration? And I, like my, my overall sense is that I would love to see, and, and this is not judgmental because Jordan is obviously coming back from a huge um, number of difficulties, the health problems, and it's kind of certainly not up to, to full strength. But to the, the hope is that it, at, in time we might see Jordan enter more into those kind of conversations. But I felt that it was... There were elements, there were moments of that in this conversation with John, but it was very glitchy. Like there wasn't so much of a sense of a, of a shared um, edifice that they were both building together. Yeah. Um, there was a sort of, I think there were moments of that, but, but it also just felt, I think glitchy is probably the best word that I can think of. I, I agree. I, in some ways, I contrast this with Jordan's first talk with Sam Harris with Brett Weinstein there. In that first talk in Vancouver, Jordan was very clearly trying to build something and Sam wasn't playing. Sam sort of played this knock it down game and Jordan kept trying to construct something. Sam kept trying to knock things down. In this conversation, I don't think Jordan was trying to knock things down. I think, I think he was, I, I, I hear in many places in the video, He's trying to grasp, to assimilate, to figure out where John is at. And so he's doing a lot of attempts at recognition, attempts at connection. But, you know, usually what you get with that, hopefully, is, is a weaving together of things. Whereas there, it was sort of two tracks. John would mention something and Jordan would connect it with something and John would go a little further and Jordan would connect it to something else. John was very gracious and sort of developing that connection a little bit, but then John continued to want to get back to something a little bit more consistent. And I think actually through the video, um, John was able to make some impact, at least in terms of John's you know, four P's of knowledge, expanding beyond the propositional into the perspectival participatory. And, and, and I think that was, that was helpful. And at the end of the video, I think they achieved some of that. Mm. Yeah. And I'd love to, to maybe go into with you sort of sifting some of those, those flecks of gold from the interview in a second. But I just thought I'd like my overall sense about this sense of dialogos, this sense of going somewhere new in a conversation, I'd like to just sort of drill into that because my sense of what, when I first discovered Jordan Peterson is like 2017, watching his lectures was, there was this real sense of exploration. Like he was, he was going on a journey. You could sort of see him in the Maps of Meaning series in 2017. It was not a dialogue, but it kind of was. You, you saw him, he'd, he'd find one of his students who was listening and he'd speak to them and he'd respond to kind of the mood in the room and you got this sense of there was a lot an aliveness to his exploration. It was like he was walking in a landscape and, and putting things together as he was walking. And I think that was part of what was really compelling about him in that sense. And then I think when he first came to um, attention in 2018, he had a series of conversations with people that also felt like they had that kind of sense of exploration. And then we saw him go on this book tour where he was pretty much with differences, like not every evening was the same, but he was doing the same story pretty much every night. And my sense is that over time, he got more and more trapped in that story, that he wasn't really on that sense of exploration or on that sense of kind of novelty anymore. And I think that, I mean, people that I know who knew him at the time also said they found him sort of he got a little bit more stuck and a little bit more reactive. And one of the amazing things that I think a lot of us really respect about him is he also reflected on that himself. I remember a, 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 a question that he answered in, a, in an AMA a while ago that I'll probably play the clip from here. He talked about the corruption of his soul that he recognized in the way that he was responding to journalists, for example. The problem is I'm becoming too much on guard, and, and I, I've noticed a, a developing sense of impatience um, within me. 
and some suspicion and that's not good. I don't want to be in situations where those are my fundamental orientations. It's it it's a it's a sign of a certain amount of internal corruption on my part. And uh I want to be in situations where I'm speaking with people, speaking honestly to people who are honestly listening. And this is what I felt coming through quite a bit in the conversation with John. It came came in and came out this sense of John would say something that sparked a story that Jordan already knew and he'd start kind of telling that story. And I've seen that quite a lot in some of his interviews since he's come back. And it it reminds me as a journalist I when I whenever I interview someone usually quite prominent who's been interviewed a lot in the past, you know that if you ask them certain questions they're going to give you a story and it's almost impossible to get them out of that once they start. The more the more famous someone is, the more used to they are to telling that story. It's like, okay, here comes the the story about this. I won't name any names, but it's happened quite a lot. And part of your job as a journalist, like, how can I get them out of those tram tracks and into new territory? And sometimes it's very very difficult because anything you say, they'll just go into the story they already know. Um, and I've had the sense sometimes with Jordan in the conversations he had since he's got back. A guest will say something, and then it's like, okay, now it's the Cain and Abel story. Now it's the Tower of Babel story, and it's like, as the audience, we've already heard all of those things. And it, there's something in that. It's like it's the when you go and see a band, and it's like, well, play the hits you already know. There's a little bit of of that, but that was I felt that coming up quite a bit in the John conversation that. John would say something and then Jordan would kind of go into something that we were already familiar with. And and that's also how I having tracked the whole kind of intellectual dark web conversation, that's where that kind of glitched out as well for me was this sense of <laughs> for various tribal reasons, for various kind of aligned incentive reasons, for various that that sense of exploration and novelty that I felt in 2018, 2019 just fell away audience capture being another issue like all of these different things start to start to just and i think because of the nature of the media environment we're in at the moment it literally warps around you 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 don't you start to kind of tune out anyone who doesn't have a positive you've got an infinite amount of feedback so you only start listening to the supportive stuff you start kind of just producing stuff for the your traditional audience some things become profitable admitting you're wrong about certain things is not profitable all of those kind of factors start to come in as well but that's why i think this is such a fascinating conversation to analyze because the topic at hand dialogos emergent alive dialogue is the thing i think that we that we were attracted to originally and i think it's also the thing that could that that will that could potentially be um Jordan's healing as well in some ways. Like I think that's what he needs, that sense of like pursuing truth in an original, in an interesting and in, in an unscripted way again. I think that would that's the sort of the the juice in some ways. The description on the video, I initially I was quite surprised the video was released at all because of the strangeness of it. And I think that was known because of the strange psychedelic reference in the title. My take on this increasingly is is more shamanic. And I think what you described is is what Jordan needs in that something needs to disrupt his sense making. We need to see in him a hunger again for something other than a lot of the political or social transformations he's been talking about. And and I think you're right that the irony of the video is that this is about Dialogos, and that is what we were looking for from it. And that is, I think, in many ways what Jordan needs. Now, I, I'm fully aware that as a Christian minister, using the word shamanic will raise a lot of eyebrows among Christians. But as a as a as a working preacher and minister, that is exactly the way the Bible works in a preacher's soul, because the Bible is a very strange book, and especially the teachings of Jesus, they're supposed to disrupt. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount, after 2,000 years, nobody's really quite sure what that sermon means. 
And in that sense, it's rather shamanic in that it's supposed to break up our sense making. So I, I think I think a number of us are looking for that for Jordan and from Jordan because with you know what I often call his first wave, I think that's what propelled him. When he came onto the scene, we heard something in that moment that broke up sort of the the staid sense making and said, Oh, here's some fresh insight. Now, whether Jordan has that in him or not, I've spoken to a number of his undergraduate and graduate students who, some of whom say things like he, your first, your first impression, your first for your first take for Jordan for a while is very, is very much that way. But then you, once you've heard about, you know, the rats and the wolves, and then he sort of, then, okay, this is all map territory and you move on. And so I agree very much that I think if Jordan is going to really content to find, to be able to make the kinds of contribution we saw in 2017, 2018, he's going to need different conversation partners. And I don't know that the current conversations he's doing, which have many of which are sort of book interviews, but they're not really interviews. In other words, he's, I, in some ways I, I see him trying to get at Dialogos and here John Verveke actually has in a very, you know, serious way, he's been studying it. And so I would love to see Jordan sort of come to John and say, help me, John, you know, find a new way of having transformative conversations that not only transform me, but transform even an audience. And and I think, as Jonathan Peugeot said, hopefully transform what is a fan base, which isn't particularly helpful, but maybe a broader community where they can be, where there can be productive pushback and productive engagement that allows all of us to grow. And, you know, that's what I've seen in a lot of in a lot of your community and and the way that you've pursued this work. Yeah, and I'd like to play that clip from Jonathan Pajot now. You're always aiming at something that's better or you wouldn't be aiming. You're always moving towards something that's better or you wouldn't be moving. So then why wouldn't you move towards the greatest good? Yeah. Well, it's because it's terrifying, I suppose, in part. But then I was, you know, I've tried to put that into practice in my life and it's tearing me into pieces. Yeah. I don't know, though, if if one of the reasons is because you're also alone. And I, you know, I, because you, I mean, at least to my understanding, you're not in a, in a, in a community. Um, well, it's you, hard to say. I mean... It's hard to say. Because fans aren't a community. They certainly haven't last. Well, they've been a community. I mean, yeah. one of the things that has held me together, certainly, is the commitment that I feel to to the people who've been so positive towards me and my family. Hmm. I mean, it was very subtle, but I, I got the sense in that that Jonathan was questioning like, the whole fan versus peer dynamic which i think we can all slip into on this um in this this the weird kind of nature of of the the business that we're in if we're making content and particularly if we're sort of if that's a big part of our lives or a big part of our business it's very difficult to yeah it's very difficult to avoid that dynamic um especially if in some ways you're kind of financially tied up with it as well but I think this was, yeah, I think that's what Jonathan, I haven't checked that with Jonathan, to be honest, but that was what I made of that interaction was was a sort of cautionary, whoa, whoa, careful, fans are not, people coming up to you after a lecture, people kind of in your comments threads, they're not the same as, as peers who will challenge your thinking, who will um, reflect back to you and will help you to kind of develop. And And that's what was also beautiful about the conversation with John is, as Jordan reflected at the end, he was, he's glad to have those relationships. And, and that's what's exciting 
potentially about uh, them continuing those conversations and continuing the, the dialogue? I think part of what needs to enter into into these into the space that we're we're sort of creating and exploring is the question of institution because in a university context the university is supposed to provide that in a church context the church is supposed to provide that what we're sort of doing out here in YouTube land does not really provide that we might have some peer accountability if I say something that I lose status in the eyes of David Fuller or Rebel Wisdom or John Vervaek or Jonathan Peugeot, there might be a little bit of accountability in there. But I think asking deeper questions about structures and institutions would be helpful in creating communities where that afford this over a long period of time. And, and I don't think any of us quite know how to do that, because I don't know that we've necessarily been able to create structures that afford that very well. Can you explain what you think those might look like? I, I don't know, because again, obviously as a, as a working pastor, churches have some of those dynamics, but all the same, those same issues of audience capture are very true for clergy because you get captured by your congregation. They pay your salary. And so then clergy then maybe go to different places. I, I, I think what we've seen created, I mean, John Verveke will often call, talk about this little corner of the internet where we're having conversations with you, with Jonathan Peugeot, with each other. We've got some of that going, but we, you know, and I liked what Peugeot said to him when he said, you know, uh, fans are not a church. Okay, well, what what is the sup church supposed to do? Uh, a church, and this is actually my, churches in the modernist frame have become these little propaganda machines. And I think that is their undoing right now. Because for many people, the last place you would go to have an open conversation about you, what you really think, even if it's heterodox, would be a church because you'll lose status for heterodoxy. Heterodoxy in itself is not necessarily helpful. And I think John's idea of dialogos, where you've got and where you've got two people seeking truth, early in the conversation, Jordan Peterson talked about sort of hunting philosophia, which I thought was good. But that's more of what we need. And perhaps what we should think about more our hunting bands where you know people people have practiced ways of collaboration they know each other's skills yet what motivates the hunt for the tribe is the need for food and i think as you described what happens to people when they get a very high status wealthy successful they're no longer on the hunt and uh, there is a certain you know Jordan's been back now since January. It's not clear what he's doing, but I fear a certain lostness because he's had a couple of successful books. You know, anybody will talk to him. Almost anybody who he wants to will talk to him. Where's the hunt? Well, there's the hunt is the inter the the internal drive towards truth which I think was what really drew so many of us to him originally. I, I would say there is an open question. You have, you have to see what are, the, what are the confounding factors in that. I mean, the whole idea of Peterson Inc. nowadays, I think, is something that... that do you have the incentive structure still to, to go for truth? Especially when certain things that you say get a certain audience... And and it's very difficult not to not to kind of follow that, even that if even if that's completely unconscious. Um, and then there's various things that y you can easily dismiss people who are critical of you as being bad faith or motivated by some other some other kind of oh they're just trying to get views off my name or whatever that might be. And then you start 
screening out people who might have useful things to reflect back to you. And you see that happen constantly in this in this landscape. And then you've got the comment sections. You've got, um, I mean, I, I find that, and I, and I think it also a little bit of self-reflection and awareness of like that that happens to all of us. Um, probably to 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 rebel wisdom um, as as much as anyone. I can't deny that I'm I'm conscious of the comment section, but at the same time, what I will say is there's a paradox of I don't think I think people have still got in their minds this sort of like alternative versus mainstream. What they don't realise is once you've created a little thing around being alternative, that becomes the status quo at that point. So I'll put out films that they'll be like, oh, that's too consensus or that's too status quo. It's like, not for this ecosystem it isn't. I know that when I put out certain things, it's going to get a bad reaction from, from the comment section. It's like, what's more brave? Putting out anti-woke stuff that I know is going to go down incredibly well in this little ecosystem that I'm part of or putting stuff out that's going to challenge that perspective. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I I'm, I'm, have to be aware of my own biases as well. Like, I, I know there's a lot of people who are like, well, you, you come from mainstream media, you're BBC, Channel 4, or whatever, and you're just still part of that. It's like, well, maybe I have some of that, but also I think there's a lot of values that were held within the tradition of journalism around truth-seeking that maybe a lot of journalism has lost, but I think... The alternative media has lost it, never really had it. Now, that's the, the key yeah. point that I keep coming back to. It's like the incentive structures of the alternative are not conducive to truth-seeking at all. Yeah. Um, the, the, the incentive structures of the mainstream are increasingly less conducive to truth-seeking as well. But that's why we're in this really terrifying valley, what I've called the uncanny valley between the two. Um, and that's what kind of obsesses me and I'm fascinated by because we're all like Jordan Peterson. Um, all of us are trying to pursue truth in our own kind of limited way and sense make together. And I think you're, that brings back to what you were saying before of like, how do we do this? Because we've seen we can't really do this alone. We've seen so many cautionary tales of people being or captured by their audience, of being, um, yeah, of basically falling by the wayside. The entire kind of history of the IDW is like one by one falling by the wayside and as an alternative sense-making structure, like that's a terrible cautionary tale. Like these are very, very smart people and they all got captured in one way or another or most of them got captured in one way or another um, or fell out or stopped kind of moving forward or whatever it, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that question of how do we do this and some kind of bands of hunters, like you say, I think is the way to do it, is to, is to be in relationship with people who are able to challenge us and we're able to kind of develop our, kind of sharpen our, our knives against each other. P part of the irony of the taking down of the mass media uh, culture has been that Part of what afforded truth seeking and internal critique, self critique within that culture was its its well its establishment, its its sense of establishment. I was speaking with an accountant who was a neighbor of mine who used to work for newspapers, and he said, you know, in the seventies and eighties, newspapers were enormously profitable. And what that afforded was the New York Times could have, I mean, it, in a sense, they were so well established, they could have all kinds of self-criticism built into it. And I think, as you well described, a lot of alternative media is so captured by audience, they can't afford to waver from their, from their dogma. And now we're seeing that in the mass media as well, because they're so hungry, they can't afford. I, I thought that came quite through. I thought that came through quite well in Peterson's Barry Weiss interview. And so actually with the decline of Blue Church, we're finding Blue Church increasingly acting like alternative, let's say, um, you know, narrowly, um, you know, narrow agenda organisms. And so again, I think there's there's both a 
a kind of a a hunger driven, a hunger for the truth driven that has to be willing to say, I don't I don't care how poor this makes me. I'm that hungry. But then probably also on the other side where you have structures that say, okay, I can I can reasonably afford to pursue the truth and I know it will cost me, but I'm, you know, that is what we do. And this kind of corruption, I think you find, I certainly see it in church structures, but now we're seeing it in, as I think Jordan Hall nicely says, blue church structures as well. It's a weird paradox that as the alternative um, gets stronger, the mainstream is becoming more alternative. Yes. Um, Yes. Yeah. I wonder just whether we might go back to as we sort of talk, as I mentioned, sort of panning for gold, like the gold flex in the in the conversation. Um, I mean, I was really interested in what they were talking about related to the. They touched on postmodernism, but only very briefly. Jo, uh, John was talking about sort of Foucault and Derrida having a little bit more of a complex, it being a slightly more complex picture than is often painted of the of the postmodernists. And that felt that felt rich in itself. That could have been a conversation. If the mainstream of Western culture is the mainstream of human culture or akin to it, so akin to that shamanic tradition, for example, then the claim is that that mainstream is is the desire for power. And that's the opposite of what we're saying. Genuinely, the opposite. It's the antithesis to that, because that isn't isn't Philo Nikea the antithesis to. Yeah, I think it is. Um, well, I mean, that's part and of is it. Sort of- is it genuinely the antithesis? I mean, so is this is this a claim of <laughs> is this a claim of satanic possession of the West? I mean, is the no, is the I, I, is the I, culture I, war that deep? Well, I don't know. I mean, the claim is that it's about fundamentals, right? It's a fundamental critique of Western society. It means fundamental. That's why Derrida went after phi logocentric, phi logocentrism. Yeah, uh, and I think, and there's, and, and Foucault does similar things. But the thing you have, you have to remember is, you know, t- t- you, it, toward the ends of Derrida's career, right? He's reaching into uh, Neoplatonic mysticism. Negative theology is something he starts to take an interest in. And Foucault, uh, you know, you know, technologies of the self, uh, and he gets very deeply interested in the work of Pierre Hadot. Right. And what is ancient philosophy and the wisdom tradition and philia Sophia? And he starts to turn towards it and starts to recognize it. as. I knew that nothing of that. I knew nothing of that. Yeah. Well, that's what. So, I mean, well, that's a, that's very interesting. And, and then he dies. Yeah. Uh, Foucault also. Or Foucault. Uh, oh, no, Derrida. We were sp- sorry. We were speaking of Derrida. We, I was speaking of both. I said, you see, yes, Foucault you getting very interested in uh, negative theology, neoplatonic mysticism. And then you see Foucault getting very interested in, uh, you know, Stoicism uh, and Pierre Hadot's work. There's an irony in Peterson's work that I thought really came between the Michael Malice and the Barry Weiss. Because on one hand, Peterson has made a name for himself bashing postmodernity. But. Peterson is himself postmodern in some deep ways. And a regular critique of Peterson, you had James K. Smith, a professor from Calvin University, on your program. And he, you know, this is one of his critiques of Peterson as well. And I I think I think the way forward for someone like Peterson in what in what way, uh, Paul, in what way is Jordan Peterson postmodern? Modernity is dying. And when and and John in that conversation nicely set up the contrast between the three Ps, which are much more lived experience, perspectival, procedural. And and so you've got the one P which is propositional. And modernity is all about the world of objects, where where Peterson when Peterson begins maps of meaning. There are two ways to view the world, a world of objects and a form for action. And so Peterson very much takes the pragmatists through modernity. But within that pragmatism, there is what what John Verveke talks about, those three Ps. And in this in this beautiful section, at a point that John Verveke makes all 
often, he says, what is emerging out of cognitive science is a recognition that our ability to grasp something means sort of taking it into ourselves. We grasp the cup. And about minute 25 in there, he goes through that. We grasp the cup. In other words, something of the cup has to get into my mind. And so the subject-object distinction is being broken down by cognitive science. And that is that is something within postmodernity that they, in fact, have been working at because – Within postmodernity, there's a critique of that subject object. We are we are um, disinterested viewers from above who see the world as it is, and cognitive science is saying that's not how we know the world at all. And and Peterson, with his sort of ancient modern approach, has always sort of flexed in that direction and asked questions that make rigid modernists like Sam Harris uncomfortable. And so when you look at, you know, Peterson drew such a strange breadth of fans, some of them, you know, as, as John Verveke said in that interview, people do not appreciate how radical Jonathan Peugeot is. And he's so radical because he's so ancient. And that ancient modern has been a tension in church circles now for the last 20 years as modernity is receding and as there is a recognition that proposition as such is always necessary. It's deeply embedded in the scientific effort, but is insufficient for human beings to actually move forward and increasingly is an insufficient descriptor. And this deeply critiques Protestantism, which is, of course, I'm a Protestant minister, deeply critiques the ways that we have framed communities. So that has always been in Peterson. And John is in some ways pushing him on that and saying, okay, what does that mean as a scientist? Because Peterson is always, if you listen to Peterson and Barry Weiss, they're lamenting the loss of Blue Church. You know, whoa, Blue Church has fallen. And, well, that's, Jordan's been pushing it. <laughs> yeah, Jordan, you could argue he's probably one of the primary factors in the loss of faith that so many people had in Blue Church, meaning the sort of media establishment. I think he he certainly and potentially quite deliberately embarked on a on his mission to show up or or one of the one of the effects was to show up all of the limitations of that structure um yeah but i i, I think yeah i like that idea and i think you're right that kind of the, the contrast and conflict between him and sam harris is very much Sam Harris, from, from Wilberian terms, is orange, um, yeah. modern, completely modern, rationality rules. And in a way, Peterson probably is postmodern relative to that, because he's, but, but arguably he's also, I mean, he's not, you could argue he's metamodern. I don't know if you know those distinctions. So... The idea in integral theory is that you've got modernism, science, which is sort of the structure. Then postmodernism was effectively a kind of deconstructive force around that, which is obviously something Peterson's placed himself against. But in a way, Peterson is postmodern in his critique of, of modernism, but he's reconstituting it. So in a way, you probably would put him integral or, or um, yeah, integral or metamodern. I mean, there's different words for it, but effectively it's the word for a perspective that can observe and understand the other perspectives. It understands what postmodernism is. It understands what modernism is. Because within those worldviews, they can't actually understand the critiques. They can't understand the, the other worldviews. Whereas the, the, the idea is that there's an integral worldview that can actually understand all of these different 
perspectives. And I'd say that's where I probably place Peterson within that. And, but his critiques are, are the same as, um, yeah, his critiques of scient scientism and materialism are very similar to a lot of the postmodern critiques. Yeah. That's an interesting and And, I, and I, I, I just, and Peterson partly gets there because of his Darwinian truth. And, and that's, I mean, when he showed up in the, in the Christian sphere, I mean, he basically uses Darwin to give an, an account for the credibility of, let's call it, ancient wisdom. Because if the wisdom has survived this long, that is a tell for truth. But ma modernity arose in the frustration with the letdown of certain forms of ancient wisdom. And, you know, I don't know very much about, you know, I've, I've listened to some of your content about integral theory, but I, I think with each passing, there's always, in the initial stages of passing, there's always throwing too much away. And, and then after sort of the, um, the tragedy of the revolution, those who are a little bit beyond it say, all right, well, what of modernity should we keep? And what of modernity was unhelpful? And, and that's successive over all of the various patterns that went before. And, and Peterson, I think part of what he has shown is he, is he has that capacity. But, and, and again, to come back to Dialogos, the, I think the questions are what kinds of conversation partners, what kinds of needs are going to help him to fulfill that potential that I think that potential is, I think, what a lot of us saw in him and say there's real potential there for breakthroughs beyond some of the siloed structures. And, and again, as someone in the church a tremendous weakness of the church has been its siloed nature. It it either has um, borders that are too thin, where it's always just me too, me too, me too, behind any, any new, you know, progressive cause, or it's so rigid that you know we're just going to try to outlast the world, but that isn't working. So, and and Peterson showed, I think, potential for affording some breakthroughs uh, with a lot of these boundary issues. Mm. Yeah, this feels very, um, yeah, very narratively right to kind of finish maybe on this, on this point. And I, I agree that the idea that who are the dialogue partners that he maybe needs to engage in to, to, to recapture that sense of exploration. I think John is definitely one. And I think, pretty much all the people who John has been in dialogue with over the last two years, like all of those, there's some fascinating conversations with people like Bernardo Castrop and um, Jonathan Pajot and others exploring and, and, and getting into the stream of thought, like jumping into the stream of thought and swimming together. This sort of sense of rather than coming from a fixed position, a sort of more malleable position where you're in dialogue with others and, and evolving your thinking. Um, I also would like, if people are watching this and they're not familiar with John Bavakey's work, I wanted to reference some of the films that, that I think would help kind of frame him in, in a better way than, than happened in that conversation, maybe. Um, we put out a few interviews with him, one called Flow, States and Wisdom, um, another one after The Meaning Crisis, which is where he kind of frames his new Dialogos project, and another great dialogue between John and Peter Lindbergh, called The Evolving Conversation. I'm going to put up the, the, the title cards from those on over the video and people can kind of find them in the show notes below. And also, maybe just, just touch on, we, we've been trying to kind of, like how can, I, I trained as a counsellor, like that's my background, and I trained in a form of dialogos called inquiry, which is really in dialogue with another person, trying to, trying to get to the edge of our understanding, trying to articulate what's going on in the relational field between us and to take ourselves somewhere new in that kind of exploration. And we've tried to do that as well with the courses that we're running as well. With John Bavakey is one of the guest faculty on our Sense Making 101 course. So I'd like to give a little plug for that. Um, if you enjoyed the conversation with John or you want to learn more, check out that course because that's 
that's part of that's part of the answer for me is like I don't think we can do this without becoming different kind with as you said before without allowing ourselves to be transformed and that's really what we've been trying to do like how can we do that's why we've had such a pro- focus on practice and such a focus on um events and sessions that that try and work with some of these technologies and i'd, I'd also point people point people towards other really amazing technologies like circling like inquiry um all of these empathy circles glass bead games some of these other kind of technologies because i think and then that links back to what we were saying before about John's 4P cognitive science the propositional is not enough the propositional is one aspect but the procedural the perspectival and the participatory is absolutely crucial and yeah i think that's that's hopefully what we're all trying to kind of bring more in our own ways well and and from I mean, from the church side of things, I mean, churches have part of that conversation that I thought was very interesting was when they, when John was talking about grasping the cup, you have a sense that you can look at the light or you can see through the light. And they're both valid perspectives, but there needs to be a transformation that occurs, obviously, in Christian tradition. You know, we've got a lot of words for this. This is conversion. This is quickening. This is, and 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 you need to do that in order to know. It isn't the question as in a modern sense where you sit above it and you you look at all the pieces and you take an analysis. You actually have to step into it in order to know, and and that sort of connects, I think, the the knowing and loving, because in you do not know unless you love and and in some ways you cannot love unless you know at least something so i mean that at least for a christian minister that's always a part of of my work and and always the the question of continuing to reform institutions always a pleasure paul and i really like your new setup you're looking very professional <laughs> well thank you david i, I um I don't try too hard at that, but uh, I appreciate it. (laughs) Awesome. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense-making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course. Sense Making 101 with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>